everybody that's joining us. Give us just one moment and we are going to connect with the artist here for conversation. Look at that. Woo, we're pro. So easy. Hi, Kristen Clyburn. Hey, hey Chris Worley. <laughs> now I'm just trying to get my uh, phone to keep from falling <laughs> over while we do this. Do this. So. Do this. This will be fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So let's see. We can get that going. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, Hi, everyone. <laughs> uh, I'm Chris Worley. Um, I have the inimitable... Kristen Clyburn joining me today from her studio in Houston. I'm in Dallas, and we are so grateful to have this incredible opportunity to link up from afar and share artist talks, conversations digitally uh, in this way. It's pretty awesome. Um, so, uh, and it's also great, Kristen, to have you in the studio um, because um, those of us who are familiar with your work um, can, can see that it might be hard to sometimes see the maker in the process because they are so, um, they almost seem to have appeared of their own, uh, you know, will, <laughs> but they're actually is a human will behind um, all of this work. So it'll be really nice to have you in the studio. I see you have your apron on, uh, which always means there's work to be done. Yes, yes, but I did leave out the rest of the head gear for the interview. <laughs> <laughs> so you can um, understand me speaking. Yeah, and so, um, Real quickly, before we talk about, you know, the making and all of that, um, the exhibition um, is titled Lost Horizons, and it is comprised of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven paintings um, that were all done um, since the um, pandemic uh, began and all of the social unrest that unfolded um, in the following months. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's a lot that, this work feels different from previous uh, shows. Uh -oh. uh, I think just from that, you know, pure fact alone. Uh, and I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about, you know, where you're coming from with this recent body. Well, everything you just said completely informed that show. Um, so all of everything that's happened has made us have to adapt. So for me, my work is usually very subtle, extremely subtle. And I kind of, uh, I look and the camera can't pick up the nuances. And it's really a direct relationship between the viewer and the work. So. Yeah. So now, now that I have to understand that probably the camera is going to be the first set of eyes on the work and people might not actually see it in person, I had to adapt and see how do I make the camera be able to reproduce the emotional quality in that work. So that was my first thing, um, was how do, I, how do I renegotiate how I make that engagement between the viewer and the work. But more specifically, um, the work definitely charged because of cultural events, what's happening. Um, uh, whether it's the introduction of new boundaries, of new uh, contrasts, very heightened saturation uh, of color. Yeah, All I'm actually that. gonna show some paintings from the show while you're talking, you're talking about these heightened contrasts and these boundaries. Um, yeah. And to my take, the heightened contrasts in a way kind of reflect the heightened emotions and maybe some of the disparity, the polarity, uh, 
that's taking place, but but also the the lines and the hard edges seem to be a parallel for just the fact that we for so long we were we were locked down. We had boundaries, um, you know, physical boundaries. We still have physical boundaries with each other as human beings, um, and we're still confined to our four walls more than we have been, you know, pre-pandemic. But um, they see, there seems to be a very strong connection between the two. Well, and you know, a lot of that is a subconscious response. So, for instance, the black and white one, uh, the, the painting to the left, my, that one, um, that was a sketch of that, you know, from a few years ago in my sketchbook. So it was just, a, it's, it was a matter of sort of going back through those images and sort of deciding which ones make sense now and for whatever that painting needed to be made now. Um, but, you know, I, I wasn't aware, obviously, that we were going to have a lockdown a year and a half, two years ago. But right. I do think that it, it resonated with me on a different level um, having that. Yeah. Um, and it just, it just seemed like it was the time for it to kind of be born. Um, so, but you can see it in, in other paintings too, where uh, in the past I have uh, had a large color piece where you could, um, you could stand in front of it and it was really oriented between you and you, your body and the work. So you would kind of sense um, an implied horizon. It was never yeah. a horizon line, but there, somewhere in the middle of that, there was a murky, depth that you felt a sense of ground and a sense of sky. So now I am, I am blocking that, that uh, perception and saying, wait a minute, now we're going to have, we're going we're gonna to have a mirror of itself, or we're going to, you're not going to have full access to that horizon. You're going to, you experience part of it and then it's going to be blocked off on either side which are pulled in a different direction. And, you know, this is what I love about work like this because you have your own place that you're coming from in the making of these works. And sometimes what it's about doesn't reveal itself <laughs> until after it's made and sometimes long after it's made, right? But then each viewer has, its, uh, has their own personal experiences that they bring to the work as well. And I, I see in these two particular pieces that I'm showing behind me, um, sort of a containment, but also in that containment, there is this um, vacuum or this space for possibility. Um, it's almost like a chamber in which something is brewing, like a pos like a potential, a potential of energy of some sort is like uh, held contained there and something to be born from it. Um, I don't know if there is, if that resonates with you at all. Uh, you're 100% you're correct. Um, it's going back to the black one, I mean, the, the frame, the white and the black outside is really static. You know, and it's like this immovable part. And then the, the next band is natural, just raw. Yeah. So the interior is a chamber and it, it is directly um, trying to create that sense of potential that, mm -hmm. you know, those boundaries are, they don't exist. And what, what happens when you have just this pure motion of, formlessness mm -hmm. you know what what ha what can come from that so mm -hmm. i mean i do think they're they are optimistic in some ways for for that reason um it's funny that you say optimistic because i'm gonna move to uh, two other pieces in <laughs> the show um and these of the are of fire one and two parentheses homage to james baldwin um, and the story that you explained to me around these works does 
um, in the end have a strong sense of optimism. And I was hoping you could share, share your experience of your beginning process in making these works and where you ended up. Um, because I think it's always interesting to see, because, because entering into a, a work of art is always a journey. You may think you're going one place, you end up at another place altogether, and there's always something to learn in the process. Definitely true. Um, okay, so, so of Fire 1 and 2, um, those just, uh, they burned into my brain after the killing of George Floyd. Um, I think globally, we all had this sense of, and I, I can't speak for everybody, but I can just speak for myself, that I was devastated by what we saw. I think globally, people... Bonded. Um, and it just, it just it created a sense of helplessness and rage in me, honestly. And so I thought I'm going to, I'm going to pick back up uh, James Baldwin's uh, 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 The Fire Next Time, which I'd read years ago, but I didn't read it in this context. And so I reread it and I was making the paintings the same time that I was rereading it. And uh, he describes his rage as growing up in Harlem, you know, and uh, the kinds of in inequalities and the brutalities and everything that he experiences a, as a black man. And, you know, and it's, it's shocking and it's not shocking that not much changed. So as I started developing these paintings, I started out just really, I wanted it to have this intensity that you know kind of charged and angry and it was interesting because as I was going through the book and at the you know in these certain parts he mentions love so many times over and over, and over as um, a way for us to heal and a way for you know those in inequalities to kind of bring our world to come together um, in a in a in a hopefully nonviolent way, but you know, that is not necessarily possible unless the consciousness kind of raises around that. So he talks about, you know, we need to love our brother as us, as ourselves, and really try to peel the, 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 the unrealities away so that we can see the realities that exist between us. So that being said, those two paintings went through a transformation and they kept getting deeper, richer, and they just, they didn't seem rage to me. They, sem they seemed like a, a, a heart of fire, um, of, of deep kind of compassionate uh, presence that was um, just a space being held to say, like, walk through that fire, but you're gonna you're gonna come out transformed and hopefully some kind of uh, deeper understanding of yourself and love. Yeah. So, uh, so, so what started off as rage, frustration, anger, you know, intensity, that red, that fire, that fire of rage and pain then sort of morphed into a warmth of uh of the heart and of love uh moving us forward that's, is that no that's to that's completely right and, and so it forward. was really important that they that they like in some, one of the things you can't see well you can see it a little bit on on the t uh, telephone but they are should have like a, a glowing from within. So they almost look like they're lighting up. Um, so that's, that's, that was a very important uh, part of the. Yeah. So absolutely nail on the head. And then also sort of concurrent to that, um, this work, which is behind me here and also on the screen is this incredible, I mean, what you would might perceive in person looking at as a double sunset stacked on top of each other, 
um, that what might be what the eye first, you know, picks up on. And um, I will say that um, the gallery had not seen this work in, prog in progress. So when we opened it up, um, I thought that the two dark areas would come, would join together in the middle and the blue would radiate out top and bottom. Yeah. But in fact, that's a completely different narrative. That's a completely different narrative for this work. And Kristen, you had something else um, in mind altogether. So yeah. tell us about, about this particular piece, the title <laughs> of it, and then a little bit more of the story. Um, well, yeah, so I'll tell you, I'll tell you also just th th one of the other things about this work is that it is very personal. And a lot of times I try to make it the work so that it's very universal. It's very personal to me, but it's also very universal. But this work definitely had a deep personal connection. So those two paintings, um, also I had a sketch of that in my studio for, I think, 2016 on my wall. So I know. And but it wasn't worked out. It was just a very light sketch and, you know, no side. So it really didn't, it didn't fully develop until this show and with the palette and, you know, but they were always going to be stacked. Um, so the title is Here Again. Right. So that, that for me is, is uh, I, we have some reverb. I'm sorry, it's kind of distracting me when I'm talking. But I'm wondering if it's me. Let me see if that helps. Keep talking. Uh, <laughs> it's probably just Insta world. Um, yeah. But anyhow. Insta verb. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> Insta verb. It's, it's about, uh, it, it could be, um, an event that you had in your own life that happens again and it's paralleling something before but it's also civil rights it's also the pandemic you know it's about culturally we've all been here before in one way or another whether it's you know just dealing with you know racial unrest uh, protesting women's rights, you know, all kinds of things are happening. The whole world's on fire. So anyway, it was kind of to show that when those two events are on top of each other, you in, 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 in person, you are, you try to look at both of them, but you can't see each one clearly. It, it, it creates kind of a back and forth viewing. So you're constantly evaluating well what's different about that than the first time I was here and going back and forth and you're like wow and you kind of get seduced by one area and then you then you get pushed out and then you go the other one and you kind of just and it's a very active kind of engagement yeah uh, can but, I can I tell you yeah. can I interrupt for a second yeah yeah so um I've had the the fun of doing a little bit of music recording just a tiny little bit and so I know that like, for me, this, this painting, I see a parallel formally between this and um, like when vocalists record a song, they can sing it on two different tracks, right? But then play those tracks in the final product simultaneously. So they're, they're, their voice is there twice. But when you record a song, you can never, you can never reproduce it exactly the same. Your breath, your intonation, your emphasis is always going to be slightly different because you're a human being, and every every stroke, every breath, every movement we make is going to be slightly different from the one before, no matter how much we try to reproduce it. So what that does is when you play the when you play that final recording, there is a tension that occurs in the sound because they they slip and slide and pull on each other and just create like an interest in sound. And so for me, this visually does that because it's not the same. Uh, it's not the same painting on top of each other. It's not the same sunset on top of each other. They are different, but they're enough alike that you might 
initially see the same thing, but the more you start to look at them, they, they change, right? They, they, they start to vibrate and push and pull off of each other. And I think that that's a really interesting, just interesting formal choice um, in the work. And, and also just personally, um, going back to just how our patterns have developed throughout the pandemic in the last six months. And this here again, you know, um, I think for a lot of people, their days have felt long and repetitious and, um, and that we're just sort of very aware of time in a way that we had not been aware of before. And so for me, this is also kind of like a, um, not a marker, but just like an awareness of time um, in and around a, 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 an area, a time in our lives when time has, has changed so dramatically from a, just a pure perception. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and that, that painting um, is the most time oriented piece of the show. Um, it's, it's not necessarily supposed to be sunset, you know, it, it, it could be a mirage, it could be a fire in the distance, but the blue part is a direct connection to a twilight color. So it, it is yeah. intended to create some kind of urgency um, yeah. or time is, you're losing time, you're losing something, you're, it's, 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 you know, it's going from one to the next. It's definitely implying sequence. So you're, you're right on about that. And I, so one thing that has always been the case with this work to me and something that I said a long time ago is that your work is like a visual distillation of feeling, of natural elements, of whatever it is that you are, uh, your subject that you're pursuing, it is like distilling it down to its like most basic elements and i'm curious what that is what that is for you you know what does what does that what does that speak about you what are you trying to achieve in the process of getting at the truest most pure unrefined essence of something that's a very good question um, for me, I would say that it's clarity to really, really get clarity. And also they provide a sense of calm for me. Yeah. Um, so, uh, from the very beginning, I have been working with ideas related to meditation and contemplation. So I am very much interested in how you perceive the, the work in terms of physiologically. And um, so I am very interested in ideas. So um, if you you're look breaking back, up just a little bit. So you're okay. saying that you're interested in physiologically and emotionally and psychologically how we connect with the work. Yes. Yeah. By distilling it and creating a field and how you how your eyes see that field and what it does to the body, I'm interested in questions. So for me, it is still about a meditation. It is still about getting the, the body to have a kind of awareness. Um, uh, it, it, you know, at the very beginning, it, it, your show, um, gap spans and zigzags. Yeah. The direct relationship to the mind and how the mind perceives information. And so the gaps are a way that when you're in meditation that you can, you don't, you have thought. There's it's, it's an absence of thought for a very small amount of time. And that, in my opinion, is very uh, regenerative um, space for our well-being. So I'm, I'm very much interested in those ideas. Um, so that's what it is to, yeah, it's, it's, it's a it's a um, color fonts to the body and the mind and the feet, all of those things. So, how does that manifest in other aspects of your life? 
um, are you trying to achieve a similar kind of um, feeling or sentiment in just other aspects of your life? Um, I, I kind of, you know, the other night, the um, when the hurricane was going through Southeast Texas and Houston got no rain, I'm sure you got some wind, but we got some wind up here and I was, it was cooler and I was lying on the walkway um, just in front of my house. I'm sure people thought what the heck's wrong with this person, but I was looking up the sky and I was thinking about you and wondering like, <clears throat> how much time do you spend just kind of looking at the sky? And, and, and specifically at certain times of the day when that, I don't know, what do you, what do you call that light, that changing light at the end of the day? In the beginning? Well, that's, that's, it's twilight and it's typically called the magic hour. Um, which really it's only like 15 minutes when the sun is going down and it, it, it's the, the light is changing and the, the receptors in your eyes are also changing. It's a changing of the guard, you know, so it's your cones and rods are moving around for different light sensitivities, but I do look at the sky a lot. In fact, <laughs> I have a, I have a 10 foot couch that's called the nap and it's along my window and I, I'm, I just, I spend a lot of time looking at the sky. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. And well, and you can tell. And I think, you know, um, one of the things that I have uh, actually Conduit Gallery, Danette over at Conduit Gallery said gloaming. Are you familiar with that uh, term? I'm not either. Okay, Danette, <laughs> you've got a stump. We're going to have to look that one up. Gloaming. Um, yeah. Maybe that's part of that changing light. Um, yeah. But did I answer your question correctly? I, mean, I don't yeah. Oh yeah. I mean there's no correct okay. answer. It's just just curious and um and so, you know, one of the things that I try to impart to people who are viewing this work is how incredibly uh difficult it is to um capture those kind of subtleties um in a painting. And so can you tell us just briefly about your process? Um, how are these paintings executed? Because like I said in the beginning of our talk, these works almost appear to have come out of nothingness, but there is very much a woman behind the work, um, you know, laboring. Um, yeah. but, they, but there is no labor felt. And I think that that is a really, um, you know, I think it's really great that you're able to to transmit what this, the feeling that you're trying to get without getting in the way of yourself. That is the most perfect thing that you could have said. Um, because <laughs> that is, I mean, but that's what, that's why I, that's why I spray. That is why I, that's how, that's why I make them the way I make so that I am trying to get myself out of the way. I'm yeah. trying to remove the, the, my, so that the viewer has their own experience. You're trying to remove the what? Sorry, you skipped. Um, the artist, the, the artist's hand. So yeah. instead of like big, you know, sort of exaggerated gestures that really make you or make me think of who that artist was and what that artist was doing, this is a way that you can interact with the work in a in in your own way. And you, you, I, I don't want you to think about me necessarily. I want you to think about yourself. Right. Um, so I, I spray apply. I have, you know, five or six different guns and four, five different compressors. And I wear a respirator. I can show you. You want me to show you? I don't know if I'm going to lose you if I go in there. Uh, yeah, we can try that. And, and, and real quickly, I mean, I think the fact that um, I know that there was some weirdness for you at the beginning of COVID and respirators and the fact that you yeah. wear respirators to do your work, but then respirators were so sort of in need and, and just the, the idea of breath. Um, and yeah. All of a that. Challenge. I have to be honest. It was a real challenge to get back into studio. I was, I was uh, not, I, it, I wasn't able to do it for a while and uh, yeah. it just it, it brought all of that but you know that probably increased the intensity of the work as well I mean there was yeah. a lot of tension between me and the environment and then trying to produce the show 
having to put that all on my face and wear these things. And the, the, I, I didn't have very much time where breathing without something, you know, mediate my breath. Yeah. That, that was, that was, that was tricky. Um, and I had a lot of, there was a lot of cussing that went along with that, but you know, it, it came together. Yeah. You got to just, you got to just push on, right? You got to push on. But you know, it also made me more um, grateful for it also in a way, you know, so it's kind of like this whole thing where you're, you know, the more restricted you are, then when you have it, the freedom, then you're more appreciative of whatever that freedom is. And, you know, I think this show is a really interesting balance of that too, because there are, you know, certain devices that are about, you know, restriction, but then the internal part finds its own freedom. It finds a way to get beyond those borders. Yeah. So, um, okay, so just real quickly, gloaming yeah. is a poetic word for t twilight or the time of day immediately after the sun sets is gloaming. <laughs> and then, I like it. Yes. Okay. There's a little bit more. It says the best thing about, this is a quote, the best thing about summer evenings is looking for twinkling fireflies in the gloaming. Okay. Okay. Love it. I like it. I Thanks like it. That. Okay. So, uh, yes, we're not going to take up too much more time of everyone's day, but um, we're going to uh, let Kristen walk us show. through the studio real quickly and, and show us um, if we can keep Keep yeah, up. we can keep a connection. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so this is this is the studios, my little box that I made. That's my light. So those are my compressors. These are my compressors. Okay. Can you see? A little bit, yeah. And that's kind these of are, Okay, yes. Uh-huh. These are filters. This is an exhaust system yeah. that I built. Yeah. Well, we might have lost her in the process of showing us around the studio. <laughs> but I think you guys get the idea. There's a lot of um, equipment that goes into this work. And I just think that it's really ironic because the work itself is so seamless, so much like breath or like air. Um, oh, you're still there. I think I hear you sort of shifting around there, Kristen. We lost you for a minute. I went the picture still, still, still. Okay, yeah. I think we're gonna leave it at that probably because um, that, that got us kind of, uh, that kind of, that kind of uh, gave us a hiccup. But what I was just telling our fabulous audience who's been with us here is just that there's just so much kind of like um, equipment and uh, construction of these works that are that feel again like they weren't created but that they just sort of existed and so that they just exist right um, on their own and so I think that that's really um, important to see uh, that that a human will and a human, that this is actually a manifestation of, of a human will and spirit on canvas. Is there anything that you wanted to tell us before we um, close out today? Is there anything that you wanted to make sure that we conveyed in, in the um, I think you did a great job to cover. I mean, we could talk forever. And forever I know, and, I could, I know. You know but it, uh, upon the most you know, important things. If anybody has any other questions, they're welcome to contact me or contact you. And I thank everybody for being here today and listening. Yeah, yeah thank you. me too. It's so great to get to, you know, connect with you like this, Kristen, and for people to get to hear more about you know where you're coming from with the work what your message is and you know what inspires you to get up get going every day i mean this is what 
this is what you do and this is how you're connecting with people and it's a real honor and pleasure for me to be the mediator between you and your work and and the viewers and the oh. collectors so thank you for yes so I thank you for your work likewise all right well everyone you guys have an amazing weekend um fall is upon us uh yet another season here again as as the painting says and um i'm thinking of you all um be well thank you Kristen. thank you bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.